Welcome everyone to the weekly Sunday service of the North Texas Church of Free Thought. It is Sunday, the 19th of December of 2021. When's the last time you visited our website or our Facebook page? Please do that if it's been a while. If you're not getting our weekly newsletter notice, you can enter your email address at the bottom of any page on our website so that you can start getting it. And then you'll be notified of our Zoom events and our once monthly first Sunday in-person events uh, in the DFW area if you can get to us. If you're watching this later on YouTube, please subscribe, hit the like button, hitting all, hitting all those wonderful buttons that help us and uh, help to spread the word. And for goodness sakes, get vaccinated against the COVID-19 and flu as, as well if you're not already. And if it's been 10 months or so since you got the COVID-19 vaccine, go get a booster. It's free, could save your life and health. And if you still need to do research, quote unquote, also known as Googling, check out what the virus does to every tissue of your body about how 1.6 million Americans now have messed up taste and smell after recovering from infection. And I've had some of these folks as patients. One lady told me everything tastes like metal. Another person told me that uh, she'll just get kind of whiffs of rotting garbage uh, that nobody else can smell. So obviously it's something going on in her brain that the virus has done to them. Also 10% of people who get COVID-19 suffer from long COVID which is uh, symptoms that linger for weeks, months, or even longer. Nobody knows uh, for sure. Um, there are just too many things about this virus that are bad, even if it doesn't kill you. Like seatbelts, some protection is better than none. So we previously considered the argument from design, the idea that God is the only explanation for the universe in reality. Today, we'll consider the ontological argument. This is the idea that the existence of God can be proved to be certain just from the very idea or concept of God. And then we'll briefly address the question of whether it is possible to prove things just by working out the logical consequences of terms and their definitions, also known as a priori or analytic reasoning. Um, figuring things out from evidence, which we're more familiar with, by contrast, is known as a posteriori or synthetic reasoning. You're, not going to be able to know if it's raining unless you look outside, for example. You're not going to know whether the Beatles are playing on the radio unless you turn on the radio and see if they're on. So uh, that two different kinds of reasoning. Now, ontology, ontological, relates to ontology, the branch of metaphysics that deals with existence, with what reality is and what it means to say that something exists or is real. So uh, there in ontology, they people argue about materialism, idealism, which is more real, material things or ideas of things, what reality is, and so forth, and what we mean by reality. So before it was known as the ontological argument, it was known as Anselm's argument, because it was first formulated by Anselm, the 11th century Bishop of Canterbury in England, and the most notable theologian between Augustine in the 5th century and Thomas Aquinas in the 13th. Anselm is often considered the father of scholasticism, Plasticism being the medieval Catholic philosophical tradition. Among his many writings was Proslogion. Not sure exactly how to say that, Proslogion or Proslogion. That means a discourse on the existence of God. Obviously then, as now, people readily believed in the existence of, oh, trees, clouds, mountains, and so on, but the existence of God was then, as it has always been and remains, in serious doubt. So Anselm thought he had solved the problem, and he thought he did it in the following way. He reasoned, God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. And then he said, if God exists only as an idea in the mind, then we can conceive of a greater being that actually exists in reality. Because a being that actually exists in reality is greater than a being that exists only in the mind, and therefore God exists as an idea in the mind and in actual reality. Anselm considered this to be an airtight proof of the existence of God, but as soon as he formulated the argument, people thought that something had to be wrong with it. As always, it's impossible to squelch doubt. Almost immediately, a French monk named Guanello, about whom we know nothing else, literally there's no, no pictures of him anywhere, wrote a refutation in which he pointed out that using Anselm's logic, any number of things could be proven to exist. Guanello gave the example of a perfect island which could not really be perfect unless it actually exists, Anselm took this seriously enough to reply, saying that God cannot be compared to a perfect island, that an island depends on God for its being, 
that the proof only works for God and that Guanello had missed the point. Others have since pointed out that Anselm's argument could easily be used to prove the existence of a maximally evil being. Now, it's interesting, in this respect, without a doubt, an evil being that actually existed would be worse than one that did not, whereas it is not entirely clear that a maximally great being is made greater by actually existing. But Anselm would no doubt have responded to this in the same way that he did to Guanello, with a resounding and exasperated, what we would say today, but that's different! The ontological argument has been kicking around ever since. It occupies something of the status of a semantic puzzle, uh, of which there are a number of interesting examples, and I thought this one from Douglas Hofstadter was a good one, since, as is well known, God helps those who help themselves, which is not in the Bible, but many Bible worshipers think that it is in the Bible. Presumably the devil helps all those and only those who don't help themselves. So the question then is, does the devil help himself? 20th century British mathematician, philosopher, and atheist Bertrand Russell, when he first encountered the ontological argument as a young man, said that he was astounded and pronounced it sound. Later, perhaps somewhat embarrassedly, he observed that it is easier to feel convinced that it must be fallacious than it is to find out precisely where the fallacy lies. And since Anselm, many people have weighed in on the ontological argument. Thomas Aquinas, widely regarded as the most influential of the Catholic Church's theologians, famously argued for the five ways that he said that God's existence could be known. But Aquinas was unimpressed by the ontological argument, saying that God is not something that anyone can form an adequate concept of. And in fact, we might think about even perfection being something that people can't form an adequate concept of, or uh, mathematical objects. I mean, how many people have an adequate concept of what uh, uh, a point is, which has no dimensions but only location. I think a lot of mathematical concepts are like that. But uh, Aquinas said that reason is insufficient to know God and that all human understanding of a God must have to come from God himself, and that's, of course, through revelation. Besides, Aquinas observed, if the ontological argument was so compelling, it would be widely accepted by everyone. In the 17th century, the French mathematician and philosopher René Descartes related the ontological argument to his notion of clear and distinct ideas. His, his, uh, one of his shticks was not just the cogito, I think therefore I am, but that if you have a clear and distinct idea about something, then you cannot be wrong. A few years later, the German mathematician and philosopher Gottfried Leibniz, he's the uh, guy that claimed that, well, despite all the evil in the world, it's, we, we live in the best of all possible worlds, an idea that Voltaire, uh, one of our free-thinking uh, ancestors uh, made uh, very much fun of and lampooned in his work, Candide. Leibniz focused on this idea of possibility. He reasoned that if it was possible for a perfect being to exist, and he, he didn't say whether it was possible or not, but the idea was that it would be possible if it did not entail any contradictions. But if it was possible, then the perfect being would have to exist. The 18th century, Scottish philosopher David Hume would have none of this. He made a distinction between matters of fact and relations of ideas. He said that relations of ideas is, is where a priori reasoning comes from, uh, but to understand matters of fact, you had to uh, actually consult the world and see what's going on, all seeing from observation. And Hume's 18th century German contemporary, the philosopher Immanuel Kant, said pretty much the same thing. While some ideas may have necessary attributes, existence cannot be among them. So the idea of God existing may be necessary to a well-formed idea of God, but it cannot be concluded from this that God actually exists. That's pretty much where things were left and where they should have stayed. But in the 20th century, the famous mathematician Kurt Gödel began playing around with the ontological argument and tried to express it formally in terms of modal logic. Now, modal logic is a system, actually several different systems, first developed by Clarence Irving Lewis, an American philosopher interested in symbolic logic, epistemology, the study of knowledge, values, and uh, other ideas. And in fact, uh, the alethic modal uh, logic is what applied in this case. And this C.I. Lewis that coined the term uh, actually was an interesting guy. He also current, coined this term qualia that we've mentioned quite a number of times over the years. So it just shows how 
the uh, modal logic uses, as you see at the bottom there, boxes and diamonds to mean necessity and possibility. So if you read the text there, uh, this guy is going to uh, buy his friend uh, a Danish, but it has to do with whether his friend goes to the gym or not. That if the guy doesn't, that little symbol to the left of gym on the top box means not. If you don't go to the gym, then necessarily you're not going to get a Danish. But if you go to the gym, then it's possible, the little diamond, that you that I'll buy you a Danish. So here's Gödel's formulation of the ontological argument in S5 modal logic. So you see the boxes and, and uh, diamonds there. The last line means necessarily God exists. These expressions were at some point checked by computer to see if there were any errors in the syntax. And of course they checked out. Gödel wasn't a dummy. But that led to computer uh, to a news reports that you guessed it, computers, scientists, and mathematicians have proved that God exists. Of course, if you look carefully, you see they put prove in quotes. I mean, what the heck? If they got to put prove in quotes, then why are they putting the word up there? Well, to get eyeballs, obviously. Here is Gödel's proof in plain English, more or less. Instead of uh, greater, the greatest maximally great being, Gödel used this idea of positive properties in this formalized version that took place of great making attributes. Whatever Anselm and others may have taken to be predicates of their perfect being or being than which none greater can be thought. Gödel reportedly began with Leibniz's version that put the emphasis on whether God possibly exists. The S5 system of modal logic is definitely the one to use with that because under the S5 system, to say that something is possibly the case means that it is the case. Now, how can that be? Well, the idea is that, say, if there is some possible world in which it is true that 2 plus 2 equals 4, then 2 plus 2 equal 4 is true in all possible worlds. And clearly, there is no possible world in which 2 plus 2 does not equal 4. So this makes sense for 2 plus 2, which we understand, but does it make sense for God, which nobody understands or can understand? As atheist agnostics, of course, we might readily agree that God could exist, or the existence of God is possible, or even that in some possible world, God may exist. That's not what... S5 modal logic possibility means. What we mean is not that we comprehend how God could exist, much less that the existence of God is well-defined, comprehensible, non-contradictory possibility, because the fact is that neither we nor even believers can understand how such things could be. Rather, we freethinkers, when we say that God is possible, we really mean we're open-minded, so show us some evidence that we can try to make sense of to see if it in any way corresponds with the idea of an omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent extraterrestrial capable of creating universes, setting up and enforcing the laws of logic and physics, monitoring every event in the universes he makes, and providing for an eternal blissful existence of human consciousness after the permanent cessation of brain function. Of course, when we say it like that, it's a bit like saying that it's possible that, or that in some possible world, two plus two does not equal four. But as I said, it's you know, we, we like to be charitable. Okay, just show us how it's possible. But there's no system of modal logic that allows for it being possible that 2 plus 2 does not equal 4. Likewise, the attributes of God in any ontological argument, whether by Anselm or Gödel, create innumerable logical contradictions. So, for example, is being male a guy, is that a positive property? It must be, since the biblical deity is said to be male, or we can be politically correct and say that, oh, that's just a little, tiny little mistake in the Bible, or it, it shouldn't be taken literally, and that really God is neither male nor female. So is that a positive property? Is being non-binary a God-like property we should all aspire to? What about being blue? Is that a positive property? And who is to judge what a positive property is anyway? If somebody says being blue is a positive property, how can we possibly say it's not? Do we all get our own necessarily existing version of God then? Um, maybe if we say that the flying spaghetti monster is our perfect God, then the flying spaghetti monster has to exist. And these are trivialities, really, compared to other God-like attributes. Think of God's being all-powerful and all-loving, yet allowing so much suffering and misery in the world, the problem of evil, of course. Or think of the alleged all-knowingness of God, but somehow humans having free will. Either these are contradictions that render the concept impossible, 
Oh, but nothing is impossible with God. Oh, my gosh. You see how you just get tied in knots. Having all positive properties does not result in the sort of being that even most believers think of as being God. Yet another question is whether being godlike is really the same as being God. I mean, being godlike is not, at least in words, the same as being God. Now, you may remember that earlier I mentioned Anselm's contemporary Guanello, who said that if God, a perfect being, could be defined into existence, then so could a perfect island. And in fact, you could just make this argument generic. You know, X, some being or person, place, or thing is a greater positive than which Y more can be thought. And then, so then a being that exists is more that way than somebody that exists only in the mind only, therefore X exists. It's almost too easy to find fault with the ontological argument and its most recent incarnations. But it should be noted that Gödel did not go about claiming he had proved the existence of God. If you've never heard of Gödel doing this, that's probably why. That is what silly people on YouTube and else, elsewhere are doing, though. If you look up YouTube uh, ontological argument, they're all saying, oh, Gödel proved God. There's uh, many of them even saying, well, Gödel was the greatest logician ever in history, and so how can you go against anything he said? In fact, Gödel never mentioned that he had gone to the trouble of formulating the ontological argument in S5 modal logic. He never did that until he thought he was dying about the year 1970. Even then, he did not publish it. He never went and spoke for it. Uh, this got published only after his death in 1978. Maybe he just did it as an exercise. Curious thing to do. What the heck, why not? We have many times discussed how we human beings learn from our mistakes, and the ontological argument is a huge, stupid, and theologically arrogant blunder. Some might wish that it had never happened, but it has also, in fact, been a fruitful error. As I said, lots of different people have put their minds to trying to figure out why it's wrong. That's helpful. Or in thinking about how and why it is wrong, we learn to get better at being clear about what we mean, making important distinctions seeing connections that matter and discounting misleading resemblances and in general getting better at making sense of things and what we mean by making sense of things. Just as what matters is not so much our beliefs as how we come by them and in what way we hold them, what matters about our mistakes is how we came to make them and how not to make the same mistakes in the future, even though we know we sometimes will make the same mistakes. David Hume was mentioned earlier in his distinction between relations of ideas and matters of fact. Hume had this to say about analytic or a priori reasoning of which the ontological argument is a prime example. And I, this is just a wonderful quote. I frequently uh, posted this in discussions to get people to uh, think about what it means. Hume said, if we reason a priori, that's the analytic thinking, anything may appear to produce anything. Falling of a pebble may, for aught we know, extinguish the sun or the wish of a man control the planets in their orbits. It is only experience which teaches us the nature and bounds of cause and effect and enables us to infer the existence of one object from that of another. And yet all of mathematics is basically an exercise in analytic or a priori reasoning. One starts with axioms and well-defined operations like addition and subtraction and so forth. And then one can prove such things as that the sum of the interior angles of a triangle is always 180 degrees. Now, these two quotes underscore the implications of this, that the reliance of mathematics in a way disconnects it from the world. Once you have these axioms, how do you know the real world is going to work that way? And that's kind of what science falls into sometimes as well. When, you, when science uh, puts forth uh, an idea like Newtonian mechanics, and then it carries out all the logical consequences of it, and then things don't start making sense, things start going haywire, then you need an Einstein to come in and say, ah, you see that Newtonian mechanics was only an approximation of this kind of mathematics, which uh, I've come up with. And the axioms of mathematics, even, the very simple ones having to do with uh, locations in space being points and lines having length and no uh, width or other dimensions, though, those things are written on our experience after all. Euclidean geometry, for example, grows out of our living on what is to the first approximation anyway, the two-dimensional surface of the Earth. Understanding rule-based games that exclude the element of chance work the same way. We can say with certainty, for example, that the game of tic-tac-toe will always end in a draw when both players play correctly. That's why most people don't play tic-tac-toe. 
But unlike tic-tac-toe, chess is not yet a solved game. Though chess end games have been worked out for three to seven pieces, counting both kings, it could be true, for all we know, that starting with the full board, the first player to move, or the, maybe the second, can always win or can at least force a draw. That no one knows is what keeps chess from being as uninteresting as tic-tac-toe. Now, you may not know this, but the game of English draughts, by the way, also known in the U.S. as checkers, is, like tic-tac-toe, a solved game. Either player can force a tie if they play perfectly from the beginning. But it took a team of computer scientists to prove this. So checkers remain somewhat interesting, and checkers tournaments continue to be held. Go, there on the bottom right, is a yet unsolved game, at least for the 19 by 19 boards that are mostly played. Now consider analytic reasoning again, the kind that uh, is done in plain English that relies completely on what words mean and how words relate to each other. This example, the most popular example by far, is to say that all bachelors are unmarried or alternatively that there are no married bachelors. How's that for proving a negative, something that atheists are often told or uh, that even atheists themselves believe? But we can only say that there are no married bachelors because the, because the word bachelors means unmarried men. In other words, to say there are no married bachelors is only to say there are no married unmarried men. It's true, but it is trivially true. Analytic reasoning doesn't get you very far because the conclusions are already there in the axioms that you assume to begin with. Now, some of you might be thinking again of Kurt Gödel right now because it was he that famously showed that in systems based on axioms, things that are defined or otherwise assumed to be the case, as in mathematics, there are true propositions that neither can be proved nor disproved. And it's not just that we're not smart enough to prove such propositions true, it is that such systems are not and cannot ever be complete. Because of this, such systems cannot be shown to be entirely consistent. Gödel really dashed the dreams of mathematicians the dream they had had for centuries, that they'd be able to work it all out. Now, this may seem abstract and have little to do with our everyday lives, and maybe at this point you're thinking, oh, you've lost me. This has huge implications for the limits of knowledge, for reasoning, and by extension with things like machine learning and artificial, not to mention human, intelligence. Despite its limitations, the sort of axiomatic truth of which mathematics is the shining example has obvious and significant attractions. Just think, if you were able to know things, to figure out the truth of things from agreed upon first principles, so much less messy and subject to error than experimental science, to say nothing of how much less trouble it would be if it were possible to figure things out in our lives relating to our relationships, our jobs, our health, and so on. It would be like T.H. Huxley saying that he would like to be a kind of clock and wound up every morning so that he should always think what is true and do what is right. That would be tremendous. And I think that many of us atheists often have to explain to believers that we don't choose our beliefs. We believe in things that we must believe in. Uh, regarding everything else, we tend to just have a lot of doubt. Anyways, if this could be done, if you could have axiomatic truth that could eliminate doubt from our lives and assure us, assure us that we could always think and behave logically and never make mistakes, and that really has been the dream of many philosophers, just like having completeness in mathematics is a dream of many mathematicians, but I think one then has to ask, is the idea literally too good to be true? And maybe it is. Get anywhere with axiomatic truth to, in essence, make all of our understanding a kind of analytic truth, a number of very serious obstacles must be overcome. Now just think of that no married bachelor's business again. What does it mean to be married, after all? Does there have to be a marriage certificate? Does it have to be from the governmental authority and the location of your residence? As we know, there is common law marriage, quote unquote, that does not involve any such certification. Does that count? And even if there is a valid marriage certificate issued by a legitimate and still existing governmental authority with appropriate jurisdiction or a court of law adjudicates the existence of a marriage, and even if there was a big ceremony in the greatest cathedral on earth that was televised worldwide and performed by the Pope, what if the couple later go get the marriage annulled? Because an annulment means that despite certificates and ceremonies and what everybody always thought, that there was never a valid marriage in the first place. As the Catholics would put it, the couple were never married in the eyes of God. God was paying attention to something else at the time. 
And we could go on in this way considering the bachelor lifestyle. I mean, some men are married to their work, right? They're not married to a woman, not at a big ceremony like, but they're married to their work. Language itself, what people actually speak and understand in everyday life, is everywhere intrinsically ambiguous and vague. It's not quite as bad as Lewis Carroll's Humpty Dumpty, has it? Someone who randomly assigned meanings to a stream of words, word salad it is called, would just not be understood. But words can have multiple meanings, and there is no agreed upon meaning for many terms. Heck, we get that criticism all the time. A church of free thought, an atheist church, an atheist church has to be a contradiction in terms. Well, we disagree. And do any two people have the same idea in mind when they use the word God? The basis of many disagreements come down to people using the same words to mean different things. This is often what causes breakdowns in communication. Lots of very important words have no settled meaning, including words like religion, as well as love, patriotism, natural, oh my gosh, there's one, and many other terms that refer to subjective situations or perceptions. Nor is there any language authority that definitively establishes just exactly what words mean. Although it may be supposed otherwise, there are no books of official definitions for words. That's right, dictionaries are guides to usage. They are descriptions of how people use words, and that usage differs in different contexts and changes over time. Despite all this, amazingly, people are able to communicate effectively at least much of the time. It is a bit like morality. There is, contrary to what the goddesses claim, no such thing as objective morality. But there is nonetheless a broad consensus about what is and is not morally acceptable behavior in human society. Anyone interested in creating a system of axiomatic truth has also to deal with such expressions as you see at the top there. This statement is false. And plenty of other statements too. There's a description and a couple of other statements, but that top statement, just think, if that statement is false, then it must be true. But if it's true, then it must be false. Ordinary language has many such pitfalls. An axiomatic system of truth with any applicability to the world of experience would also need to incorporate things like conditionals, possibilities, time factors, obligations, whether something is obligatory or only permitted, and even good or bad, as we encounter it in everyday life. Modal logic, of course, as you could tell from earlier uh, discussion, is an attempt to get at this. And it's no coincidence that beginning in the 1930s when C.I. Lewis first formulated modal logics, that the Polish-born 20th century mathematician and philosopher Alfred Tarski, there he is there, he developed a theory of truth that overcomes such things as the liar paradox. His solution was the concept of meta-language. A couple more things you're gonna have to look up. They're just too much of it to go into today. I'm not gonna get into that, and I'm really not competent to delve into these subjects except to note, as was mentioned earlier, how important they are to the new sciences of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So, of course, the ontological argument does not prove the existence of God. But if thinking about why it can't do what Anselm was sure it did, and even people today are so sure just because they want it to do what they think it does, if understanding why it's wrong helps us to better understand and improve some of the methods being used to solve current and future problems, then that is all to the good. And if you're listening today has made you think about things you otherwise might not have, then that is all to the good also. This is what church and religion ought to be. They ought to stimulate one's mind, not stop it from questioning, doubting, wondering, and growing. I'll just pause here a few uh, seconds. If any of you have any questions, comments, corrections, or objections, those of you on the um, Zoom call today, just go ahead and unmute yourself and point out something to me that I did wrong or said wrong. Otherwise, we'll have some concluding comments. I need yes, some. There are none. And... Oh, ahead. sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, you said something. I missed something about a tar targ scheme. Uh, you said uh, right before you said meta language. Yes. Um, well, Tarski was a Polish-born 20th century mathematician who uh, worked out how to overcome the liar paradox. Oh, okay. Uh, that's that, what it was. That's... Okay. So. Uh, Thank you. And, and other kind of word paradoxes. I mean, you need to solve these problems if you're really going to have artificial intelligence. 
I think there was one of the Star Trek episodes in the original series where they defeat some bad computer with the uh, liar paradox. So clearly that's such an obvious thing. They, they should have thought of that. But you know, what the heck, it's nice when these things get into the popular culture. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll just move on. Um, as you know, we often will put up some things that happened on this day in history. December 19th, 1606, three ships departed England, the Americas, and they were the ones that ultimately founded Jamestown, Virginia. How interesting. Think how long ago that was. And in 17, 1777, Washington's troops began wintering at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Think how cold it is this year. It's even colder up in Pennsylvania, so that probably is a good time for them to hunker down. In 1907 was the Dar Mine Disaster. This was also in Pennsylvania. It was a coal mine. And apparently some <clears throat> one or more miners were carrying open lamps, open flames, into an area that had been cordoned off. Uh, apparently it had been recognized that there were flammable gases there, but uh, they're carrying open flames into there, resulted in a, an explosion, and 239 people were killed. Um, the worst mining mm -hmm. accident in the United States uh, to date. And in 1972, the end of an era, Apollo 17, the last crewed manned mission to the moon, returned to Earth. And then before mm -hmm. we get to our off-the-record discussion, keep in mind there's a big difference between respecting people, which we should also always do, and respecting beliefs, which many times we're not going to do with believers and even with other fellow unbelievers. Of course, everyone has a right to hold their own opinions, but keep in mind that you may or may not understand exactly what their opinion is. Maybe you didn't understand it quite right. There might not be time always to um, think about it and ask them what they meant by that. Remember, people using the same words to mean different things. But always respect people's beliefs, even if what they're saying does, doesn't sound quite right to you. And it's perfectly okay to say, well, provisionally, I think I'm disagreeing with you, but I'm going to have to think about it. So that, that's how to maintain civil conversation. I put this up in the past. I think it's a wonderful little uh, acronym, PAUSE, because it explains what you should do. First of all, paying attention to your, especially your emotional responses. And maybe emotional is too strong a word since it includes all the non-rational responses that pop into our heads, often unbidden and often uncomfortable. The things that come from the gut is what I'm talking about instead of from our thoughtful assessment. These are things that clash with facts and reason or rub us the wrong way, sometimes for reasons we don't understand right away. Looked at from the vantage of facts and reason, they may not be just non-rational but irrational. They're often unwelcome and interrupt our ability to think. Uh, no wonder we uh, have to uh, think about this. Uh, our ancestors thought emotional reactions are incited in us by supernatural beings. Remember, you're, you're falling in love because you're hit by the arrow from Cupid and so forth and so on. <clears throat> As I said then, think of the passages, too, in Homer's Iliad, where gods are flitting about putting emotions into people. This is what they really believed back then. Or even the Old Testament shows this, too, that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh in Exodus 9.12. Pharaoh was all ready to let, let the, uh, the Jews go, but uh, God hardened his heart so that he would not, and so that he could show his glory. And Paul, in one of the epistles, uh, struggles with that. The problem for us is that our dislike for these feelings can cause us to attach them to others. If we're not going to attach them to supernatural beings, let's not also attach, uh, do the alternative of attaching them to others instead of uh, looking at what these uh, feelings or these responses really are. Others do not make us feel a certain way. We do it to ourselves, and we are the ones who ought to take control. We are adults. We are thinking beings, and we can reprogram ourselves, but we have to often kind of look at the lines of code and see what needs to be changed. So after the P and pause, we should acknowledge, we should recognize and accept what we're feeling. And what we're feeling did not come about magically. Rather, there are almost certainly some pre-existing assumptions and experiences that underlie what we're feeling. Maybe somebody just said it the way that some bad person in your life said it. The U is for understanding. We seek to assess and make sense of where we're coming from. We have to understand ourselves as well as others. If we're going to understand others, we need to understand ourselves. And there's always more opportunity to do that. Uh, who we are, of course, where we're coming from is a part of who we are, but, uh, and we can't necessarily help that. But we can always and should always grow and improve and learn, like I said, to reprogram ourselves 
figure out how we can be better. Indeed, it is the essence of what our church preaches, that real religion is about making sense of the subjective side of the human condition. And if you object to the traditional mainline churches being all rigid and dogmatic about things, then apply the opposite in your own life. Uh, look at how you can improve yourself and uh, have uh, a better and calmer and more instructive response. So this includes, especially includes those uh, aspects of the human experience that make us uncomfortable um, as we go through life. Uh, the S is for seeking other perspectives. Seek other perspectives. This means remembering that our perspective is just that. It's our perspective. But there are others. And this means questioning what we thought we knew and even what everybody knows. It means exploring alternative ways of looking at things. And, you know, if you wind up getting back to the same old place, that's fine. At least you've ranged out over what some other possibilities might be. And finally, the E is for examining one's options. Figuring out what our options are is not always easy. Hopefully, we can think of more than one or even three or four. Hopefully, we then choose the best one or maybe a mixture of them. It's okay to tell ourselves, and it's okay to tell others, too, that everything we say and do has a tentative character. You can just say, I totally disagree with what you say, but maybe I need to think about it more, and I will. Remember, there's always next time. Don't go on to think about an interaction that we have, then we really did not take much from it. And we will make mistakes. That is how we learn, remember, as we say so often. It's not a bad thing that others think differently than we do, even if, as we know, sometimes others think it's a bad thing that we think differently than they do. General Patton's observation is not a bad one to share when appropriate. No. Better than anything in the Bible, I think. There are some other good things that have been said in the, in the same vein. This one was attributed to the Dalai Lama that when you talk, you're only repeating what you already know. It's already been there in your mind, unless you really are responding to something that's been said. But listening, that's when you really learn something new. Remember, this goes to what I've already said. We are minds and bodies, and being aware of our own and others' body language, voice, intonation, posture, and behaviors is a part of how we experience the human condition. Sometimes it's best to just take a deep breath and let things go, at least for now. This is the way of free thinkers. Reiterate our principles. If you haven't seen this many times, if you don't know it by heart, well, then this is the time to uh, look at it again. Reason, which is how we make sense of things. Enjoyment, which is the purpose of making sense of things. We enjoy making sense of things, as Richard Feynman put it, the, the pleasure of finding things out. Appreciating, which is a little bit different than enjoying because you discover the good, and sometimes discovering the good is not very welcome, but it's reality, and reality is what it is. And finally, love, which is to explore the meaning and purpose and the things that you place value on. And all of these things change over time, they should change over time. Thank goodness they change over time. We ask not just for your moral support and participation in the discussion of the ideas that are important to us, but also for your financial support. Let us know what else you would like to see us do and be prepared to help us accomplish it. In fact, that's really the best. If you have an idea, let us help you accomplish that by you helping us accomplish it. Please visit us on Facebook and Twitter. We're not very active there, but they are outposts of our facts and reason-based outlook, and they are important ways for us to increase and improve the impact of our free thought point of view. It is your values that are at stake. If you're truly committed to those values, if you believe they're important, remember that belief is, as the philosopher, American philosopher, Charles Sanders Pierce pointed out, a disposition to act. If you believe something, but it doesn't affect at all what it is you do, what kind of belief is that? We find fault with others who do not act in support of the values they say they hold, so let us act in support of our values. Together we can do so much more than any of us can do on our own. And look at that, we're still doing this discount. You use a code Think Now, and you only have to tithe 8%, full 20% discount from the usual 10%. Gandhi, uh, well, before we get to his quote, again, just join us. Help us celebrate doubt and make sense of religion instead of letting kooky people run away with the idea. And as Gandhi put it, demonstrate your commitment and be the future you wish to see. 
So with that, I will thank you all very much, and good morning to all of you. And I put this up uh, for the last uh, several times. Uh, last month, I think, is when I started. Melius facet is Latin. It means do better. Kind of like a little slogan you might have, like the Marines have Semper, Semper Fi, stuff like that. This strikes me as a great slogan for free thinkers. I think it's a good one to commit to memory. Feel free to use it in your bylines when you email and so forth. How can anybody object to the idea, Melius facet? do better. And yeah. in a way, this is all we really ever talk about, isn't it? And with that, for those of us in today's uh, video conference, we'll go off the record discussion. And I'd very much like to hear what you thought about it. Um, this was a, a great joy for me to kind of read about and uh, discuss and, and think about in my mind. And um, I hope that there was material in here that you had not heard of before, food for thought. I don't like it, be eating <clears throat> eating the same old food for thought that you always had. That's like having gruel every day. So hopefully this has been a little bit of a treat.